name is Leonard Kleinroth. I'm chairman of the computer science department at UCLA. We have here a really exciting and dynamic environment. And one of the activities that contributes to that environment and that excitement is the constant flow of visitors who come and spend time with us and interact with our faculty and student body. Each year, we select a few from among the very best researchers in the field and ask them to participate in our distinguished lecture series. The high point of their visit is the presentation of a lecture to our faculty and student body. And at that lecture, they present the state of the art in their field of specialty. They describe the research results, the open problems, and the directions in which the field is likely to go. And as you might expect, these lectures always generate a great deal of enthusiasm and interaction. I'm really pleased you've chosen to join us today. Let's go inside. The lecture's about to begin. All right. Welcome. Fear not. There's more cookies on the way, I'm told. That was done more as a form of self-defense than true, but in fact, they really are in the way. Welcome to the second distinguished lecturer, lecture of our series this year. Now, I'm really pleased to see this enormous turnout. Uh, especially, we have more than just our local students, lots of people from industry and the outlying areas. It's a welcome to you as well. I'm sure you're, gonna, you're in for a big treat today. Today, we have Danny Hillis talking to us. He's well known for the connection machine. As I told you uh, many times, I like to get some personal history and some motivational factors as to why these high achieving people have reached the status they have. So I asked Danny what got him going. And he took me way back, way back to the time when he was playing with a set of blocks as a child. <laughs> <laughs> and he found he didn't have enough blocks to build the complicated structures he was interested in. <laughs> Same was true of Tinker Toys. That was one of the driving forces that led him into, quote, massive parallelism. The second factor that influenced him in those early days, his father is a medical doctor, and his field of research was hepatitis. And there's a lot of field work in hepatitis, which means you go to the field, which means you go to many, many countries which are not well known for their sophisticated infrastructure. And so he spent his time living in a large number of countries. He was, attended 12 different schools by the time he reached the sixth grade. There was not a lot of stability in that environment. But as a result, his father had a laboratory here and there. And Danny would tinker and play and watch what went on at the laboratory. For example, he would grow cultures in his lab. One experiment he did in some faraway country was to dissect a frog. And then he took these cells from the heart muscle and cultured them. And he was amazed to see these cells continue to twitch for days after the frog was gone. So the concept of independent behavior, of many little things cooperating, began to influence his thinking. And got him interested in biology. <laughs> and neurobiology, and neurophysics. And he got interested in controlling elementary behavior. And so he went to MIT and entered as a biology student, and graduated with his bachelor's degree as a mathematics student. It was a kind of metamorphosis that took place in his early years there. That's when he got interested in trying to figure out how neurons do their computation, and therefore an interest in computers. And he began to simulate things inside a machine, and he suddenly realized for the first time in his life, he now had the ability to build as many blocks as he wanted. There was no limit to how many things you could simulate in terms of number of basic elements. And so he was thrilled. At the same time, he had an interest in how children think and learn. He took a job at Milton Bradley as a game designer and started to design games and uh, toys. In fact, he worked under the tut tutelage of the gentleman who designed Candyland, for those of you who know Candyland. So you can see there were great things in store for Dan. While I was at MIT, video games came along. People at MIT were interested in designing chips for those video games. And Danny was interested in designing chips for toys. 
the same time, he had a burning desire to work with Marvin Minsky. Now, how does a young man get to work for a well-known person like Marvin Minsky? Which is probably one of the problems many of you are thinking about. Mm -hmm. And his strategy was the following. He figured he'd have to have a novel idea to break into that environment. And so he looked over the proposals that Minsky and Papert were writing at the time. And one of the NSF proposals, they pointed out that there was a problem for which they had no solution. Namely, how to assist illiterate children to program computers. And then he conceived of the idea of putting pictures on cards and attaching those cards to buttons so they could, in fact, interact with the machine. Papert loved the idea, and Danny was hot. In fact, that idea, as many of you may know, has found its application for basically um, cerebral palsy victims and people who have severe handicaps to interact with machines. And I know a number who, in fact, do it exactly that way. On the other hand, um, Danny still wanted to work for Minsky. And Minsky was nowhere to be found. And then Danny found him in the basement, building General Turtle. Basically, he wanted to build a, uh, a workstation based on a microchip. And ICs were just at that time developing in the 70s. And he found Minsky in the basement laboratory, designing, building, wire wrapping, Minsky, wire wrapping. And in poking around, Danny noticed that Minsky had say, made some mistakes in his circuit design. So Danny just ambled over and started fixing them. And Minsky noticed. And Minsky thought Danny was working for him. And so suddenly Danny was working for him. And off he went. And meanwhile, at the AI lab, a PhD uh, was accomplished on the, on the problem of doing common sense reasoning in parallel. And it involved searching some very large databases. And then he thought he'd like to build a, a chip to assist in that. Again, lots of parts, lots of logic elements on a chip, lots of parts. And that got Danny interested in parallel processing. He got his master's degree there in robotics. He got his PhD studying massive parallelism, which led to the concept of the connection machine. And at that time, I remember Marvin Minsky, who was supervising Danny's dissertation, would go around the country and give lectures on this project at MIT whose goal was to design a machine, build a machine with a million processors. This is way back when. Attracted a lot of attention. When Danny finished, he wanted to build such a machine. He realized it was too large a project for university. So he went to big industry. He went to IBM, he went to Cray, and they both said no. They passed him. Danny ran into an entrepreneur, Sherry Handler, who wanted to form an AI company. They got together, they went to DARPA, they told DARPA, they convinced DARPA, to buy one of the machines before it was built. DARPA agreed, they paid, this helped Danny get some funding for the rest of it, and the rest is history. Danny is founder and chief scientist of Thinking Machines Corporation. Meanwhile, another aspect of Danny's career is that he, uh, he interacted with another well-known person, Claude Shannon. The overlap in interest was they both liked toys. I don't know how many of you know Claude Shannon or some of his uh, extracurricular activities, but he's a juggler, he loves chess, and besides that, he does information theory. Okay, but the point is, Danny had a thing going with, with uh, Claude, Shannon. He would, every time he went to Claude's house, he would drive up in some other unusual vehicle. First time, he drove up in a fire engine. Now, by the way, all of you who have campers and vans or know about them, Claude Shannon was probably the one to invent that concept. He bought a bus, an old school bus, and converted it into a camper, and then the industry took off. And by the way, Minsky also had a bus like that as well. Second time, Danny came, he came in a checker cab. Third time, on a bicycle built for two. Next, helicopter. Shannon's house is on a lake. Danny came in on a windsurfer. Next time, an amphibious car that he owned. And the last time he came in, really hit the newspapers, Danny invented what he calls boat pants. A pair of pants, that's a boat. <laughs> you sit in this thing, keeps you afloat. It has a kind of uh, propeller that drags you forward. It's got a battery in the back for counterweight. It should make your way across. I remember the pictures of Danny. I mean, it was the weirdest looking thing you can imagine. Danny keeps going back to concepts in biology to understand evolution. And his message to you is this. What fascinates him is emergent behavior recognizing that lots of simple things 
add up to much more than the sum of their individual parts. And in fact, the concept of collective behavior and emergent behavior is something which fascinates him and he thinks has great promise for research. We're going to hear today about massive parallelism and what Danny's learned about it. Danny? is to make sure that you're really enjoying what you're doing. And if you ever lose that, then you're probably gotten into the wrong field. And I'm going to try to tell you why it is that I enjoy what I'm doing in, in parallel processing. And it, it does have to do with this idea of taking a lot of simple things and getting them to go together and, and do something that's more than the sum of the part. It also is exciting to me because it's an area where there's still a lot of the things that, quote, everybody knows are turning out to be wrong. And that's always fun, particularly when it's one of the things that you thought you knew. And I think that a lot of times when you see the re results of engineering, you say, gee, that looked, either you say that looks obvious or you say, where did that come from? And you don't see a lot of the process of the confusions that led to it. So I thought what would be interesting for you today is if maybe I tried to explain over the last 10 years what have been some of the confusions that we've gone through in parallel processing and how they turned out to be wrong. So what were some of the surprises? Um, now, in a lot of these cases, there are things that I was confused about but just kept on going anyway and was lucky enough to sort of blunder my way through. In some cases, it was, I didn't even understand it well enough to be confused about it, but, but other people who understood it better were confused. <laughs> uh, so what I'm gonna do in the first part of the talk is just explain sort of some of the myths about parallel processing that were pretty prevalent 10 years ago, um, and explain sort of why they made sense. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll sort of explain what we learned about those myths and how it's kind of changed, how our view of them has changed around up till this point. Of course, it may still change back to the other thing. Um, and then in the third part of the talk, um, if I still have time, I'm going to maybe talk about another example where I think that there are still, in a somewhat different area, where I think there's still a lot of myths and we're maybe back to that first stage again presently. So whatever you do, don't just stay for the first third of the talk because I'll explain to you all these myths and why they make sense. Everything I will say in the third, in the first part is really uh, mostly turned out to be confusions. Okay, let me start with if you went back to say just ten years ago, to around 1980, there were certain things that were kind of known to everybody about parallel computing. Um, one of the things that was known is that most problems, or the many problems are fundamentally sequential in nature. And there was a long list of such problems. Um, and here's an example that was always given as kind of a canonical problem, something that, that can't be done in parallel, but has to be done sequentially. And the problem is called the, the pointer following problem. And it's essentially this. Let's say that you have an address to a location in memory. And that location in memory has an address in it of another location in memory, someplace else. And I'll just draw it here, but it can be any place in memory. And then that has the location of another one, and so on. So these are each set of forwarding addresses, a whole chain of forwarding addresses. And that stretches through memory a chain of thousands long. And what you need to do is get the one at the end of the chain. Now, it seems very intuitive, and it was kind of obvious to everyone that that's fundamentally serial. You have to get this one before you can get that one. You have to get this one before you can get that one. So. Now, it turns out that many problems have built into them that kind of structure. And so it was assumed by pretty much everybody, and certainly was assumed by me, that all these problems wouldn't do well on parallel processing. Now, there was also something else that was sort of known by computer designers 
that suggested that parallel processing wouldn't work on a large scale, which was something called Amdahl's law. And for years, every time I gave a talk on, on parallel processing, and I, you may have been at one of these talks, somebody would always raise their hand and say, excuse me, but haven't you ever heard of Amdahl's law? Don't you know this is impossible? And here's what Amdahl's law is. And Gene Amdahl, one of the great computer designers of our time, pointed out the following thing. If you have a problem, and I'm just going to draw the problems, this is how big the problem is. And let's say that 90% of the problem you can do in parallel, but 10% of that problem you have to do one thing at a time. So 10% of the problem is something like this. Or 10% of the time is just fundamentally sequential because say it has to do with I.O. Something like that. Then Amdahl said, you can never use a whole lot of processors. You can never use more than a few dozen processors on that efficiently. And here's the argument. Let's say that this is the sequential part of the problem and this is the parallel part of the problem. So now if I put 10 processors on that, then I can speed this up by a factor of 10. So I'm essentially shrinking the problem. So this part I'm not going to speed up at all. So by putting 10 processors on it, I maybe make it twice the total problem twice the size. I have half the size. Well now, notice that by putting 1,000 processors on it, or 10,000 processors on it, I'm only shrinking that part of it. So I can never speed it up by more than a factor of 10, no matter how much I put on it. So that argument was used for a long time about why machines with, with large numbers of processors would never be practical, would never be efficient. Now, there was also another argument that seemed intuitive at the time, and I'm really, those I can reconstruct where they really sound sensible. This one sounds pretty silly in retrospect, but at the time a lot of people believed it. That there was something about numerical problems that used something called direct methods that made them not work in parallel. And the basic notion was that, and I'll, I'll explain it more as we get into it, but there's different ways of solving a numerical problem. Let's say you're trying to solve a fluid going around. Now people believed that you could solve the, the problem by sort of simulating the fluid by making an almost analog computer parallel. But it turns out that many of these problems people actually solve by writing down a large set of equations. I'll explain this in a little bit more detail. And then doing algebraic manipulations on those equations. And it was thought that those <coughs> algebraic manipulations were somehow fundamentally sequential and serial. And in fact, in a lot of cases, the way that they were doing it was. So there was a general belief that parallel computers would never be good for these sort of direct methods and complex methods. There was also a belief that <coughs> parallel computers would require fundamentally new programming languages that were used completely different concepts than sequential programming languages. Because they would have to express concepts like synchronization, um, semaphores, ways to prevent processors from, from stepping on each other's toes. And sort of related to that was this whole idea that as you increase the numbers of processors, the programming would somehow get more difficult. And the experience people had was sort of this. They knew that programming a single machine was reasonably difficult. But then when they took two processors together and got them to talk to each other, it got harder. And they put four processors together and it got even harder. So people kind of extrapolated this in their mind and said, well, you know, the way that it's getting harder, once you get up to 1,000 processors or 10,000 processors, it's going to be so hard, you'll never be able to program. That's a sort of plausible argument in the same sense that it's sort of plausible that if you <laughs> want to learn to ride a tricycle, you should start on a unicycle and then go to a bicycle. <laughs> but the experience people had with small numbers of processors in fact verified that. Another uh, thing that was well known at the time too, was that while you might be able to speed up processing, input output in particular disk drives, were fundamentally limited by mechanical limits of how you could speed things, uh, how you could spin things up and so on. And so using the Admolds law type arguments, even if you sped up the processing altogether, you get killed by the I.O. So there was a feeling that 
it was pointless to work on speeding up processing by a factor of a thousand. But it made sense to speed up by factors of two and four, but that you would be killed entirely by iron. There was also, I'll have to skip over some of these. Because um, remember, I have to unsay every one of these. Um, but maybe one of the most important ones, and, and, and this one's particularly important um, because I was very confused about it. It took me a long time to get unconfused about it. Was about the relationship between the two types of two types of ways of doing parallel processors, which is the SIMD <laughs> machines and memory machines, the single instruction machines and the multiple instruction machines. And the one way of building a parallel processor is to have all the processors executing the same instruction at the same time. And another way is to let them all go off and do different things. Now the general assumption that everyone had was that for most problems, we really wanted them all doing different things. They wanted to be running completely different programs and doing completely different things. And that really came from the extrapolation of looking at one processor, two processors, four processors. When you did two, the best way to do it was to divide the problem in half and do one kind of thing on one processor, another kind of thing on another processor. And so the argument was that the reason for MIMD was that everybody really wanted to do different things on all the processors. There was a counter, and that's the, where you do different things. There was a, the argument for single instruction multiple data, where they all walked and did the same thing, was that the hardware could be made very efficiently. It was very simple. And then I guess just one final thing that was a technological sort of idea that was sort of intuitive to everybody that you should make the fastest computers out of the fastest technology. So there was good, strong arguments why for fundamental physical reasons, the fastest semiconductor technology was non-saturated bipolar technology. That is, um, ECL uh, transistors where you're burning a lot of power. And the basic idea is if you're burning a lot of power, you can discharge capacitors quickly. And so therefore, it's sort of fundamentally much faster than a technology like uh, CMOS, which was considered a technology for toys and video games and calculators. Um, but fundamentally slow and, and good for low power stuff. Okay, so that was the sort of general feeling at the time of um, parallel processing. Now, fortunately, I didn't know some of these arguments or I would have been convinced by them. Um, but also, I think I was coming at it from looking at a very particular problem. I, I think you know, I certainly I'm not the only one that made my way through this minefield, but I'm going to give a personal account of how, how I made it through. But other people were making it through in very different ways. Some of them by figuring it out much more than I did. I did it a lot by luck. Um, but I was personally just interested in solving problems in artificial intelligence. And I had a compelling reason for biology to believe that massive parallelism works, which is but everything that we know about how our own minds work, we believe it's done by neuron switching. Now neurons are much slower than even the slowest transistors. And they switch in milliseconds instead of nanoseconds. And yet, we manage very quickly to, for instance, recognize a face, understand language, perform common sense reasoning, all the stuff that you have to do in artificial intelligence. So somehow with these very slow components, we managed to do this very fast thing. So there's a compelling reason to believe that in spite of all of these arguments, which are very sensible arguments, at least for the problems that people do, like visual recognition, you ought to be able to do them in parallel with slow components. So I guess that to me was the sort of compelling reason to believe that this was a project worth pursuing, even though there was a lot of good arguments why this wasn't a good way to build general purpose computers. So, so I initially started with some problems in common sense reasoning, later went to some problems in vision, and initially began to work on algorithms that were expressed in parallel with the idea that maybe 10 years from now somebody would build a machine 
that somehow worked like this, using a lot of little slow components. Um, now, at the, at the time, I was exposed to the toy design stuff to this, to this technology of CMOS and <coughs> other, um, at that time, what was considered large-scale integration. Um, and we could put tens of thousands of transistors on a chip or something like that. And um, it was sort of clear very quickly that, gee, you could really, you could really build something like this out of these components. But even though they were slow, CMOS was very slow at the time, they were cheap because they were getting used in Pong and calculators and stuff like that at the time. <laughs> and um, it was clear that they were going to get cheaper. You could just print them up. You could, use, you could use many of them. And so it seemed practical that you could build a machine that somehow did parallel algorithms. I didn't take the neural metaphor that literally, partly because I was, really wasn't very convinced that people knew what neurons do. And I'm even more convinced of that now. So I think that the so-called neural networks that I think are very interesting don't really correspond that closely to what neural neurons do. So I was interested in having something a little bit more general that you could program to do any specific computation and a more general form of communication so that you can wire them up in, in any particular way. So um, that led me to sort of make it a general purpose processor and put it in a general purpose communication system. Now I'd like to say, I mean I wish I could say that at the time I understood the reasons why all those arguments were, were false about why this wouldn't be a general purpose computer, but I didn't. And in fact at the time uh, when, we, when we started, even when we started the company to build it, and uh, when we sold our first machine to DARPA, things like that, it was really sold as a very special thing to solve this one problem. Um, and in fact, we would say explicitly, and don't worry, it's not intended to be a general purpose computer because of all those reasons. Now, the first person that really sort of shook, shook us up on that notion was a summer student uh, named Richard Feynman. <laughs> <laughs> I actually came here and, and visited him at Caltech. We were, we were friends. And, Ask him if he had any good, uh, when we were starting up the company, I explained this idea of, of the machine and being kind of looking at it and said, I'm going to start a company to do it. He said, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. And you're absolutely crazy. And I said, well, you, if you've got any students that you think I could hire for the summer? He said, yeah, well, I've got this one guy. He doesn't know anything about computers, but he's pretty good at math. And, um, you know, he's probably pretty general. And, you know, he'd fall for a dumb idea like this. <laughs> so I said, okay, what's his name? He said, Richard Feynman. So he was actually a, a first summer student. Feynman got there, and Feynman said, well, you know, all this stuff about common sense reasoning and vision process, and that's very nice, but this thing ought to be able to solve a real problem. And by Feynman, what Feynman meant by a real problem is physics. <laughs> so he started playing with writing a program for the connection machine to do quantum chromodynamics. And at that time, I guess um, uh, Chuck Seitz and Fox were in fact building a machine at Caltech to do that. So that's why he thought of he used to thought of attacking that problem because they were building a machine, a hypercube based machine out of processors, so it was an obvious extension. Now. My processors, because they were designed to do this other thing, couldn't even do arithmetic. I mean, they were just single bit processors that did Boolean manipulations. But finally, said, oh well, you know, bits are bits. <laughs> <laughs> we'll write the program to do multiplies and, and arithmetic and so on. And he actually wrote floating point multiply doing bit manipulations and things like that. And at this time, of course, there was no hardware. But he made the calculation of how fast this would run in the hardware we were building. I have to admit, the whole time we were kind of, well, he's a nice guy and we'll let him do what he wants. And we thought this was kind of a waste of time because it was obvious that if you want to do arithmetic, you had to have some arithmetic units in the machine and it would be efficient. But what Feynman discovered when he did the number was that 
the machine that we were building was in fact going to be faster at doing the QCD problem than the machine that was being designed specifically for that problem with Caltech. And the reason was, was because basically we had a lot more hardware in there. We had a lot more processors. So I forget what numbers that they were building at the time, but they were using kind of, um, I, don't remember, I think it was 64 microprocessors or something like that. And we were using 64,000. So even though our little things weren't doing anything designed to do with arithmetic, the fact that there was all that parallelism really made it run fast. And then that was surprising because by that time I knew about these arguments about Anvil's law and things like that, and it shouldn't be for a general problem, but it was speeded up like that. So at the time we sort of just chalked that up, well, there's something funny about that QCD problem. But that was the first real numerical problem that um, really showed it would work. And I still remember Kleinman coming up and saying, hey, Danny, this machine of yours is actually good for something real. <laughs> now, it turned out that it was a good thing he was right, because nobody was going to buy computers to do neural network processing. Uh, maybe a couple of universities did things like that. But in fact, it was a huge market for doing these kind of physics problems, engineering problems, things like that, of traditional supercomputers. So <coughs> that was the first hint, I think, that something more general was going on. Now, the next thing that surprising was when somebody came along and said, and to be honest, I can't remember who was the first person who did it. Because it sort of kind of snuck up on us gradually. A bunch of problems that we thought were of this form, people started doing in parallel. And then somebody pointed out, and I should really find out who did this first, but I think a lot of people were doing it kind of at the same time. But a bunch of people realized that this problem is, in fact, not fundamentally sequential. Problems of this sort are not fundamentally sequential. And I'll show you the trick. Does anybody see the trick? The basic idea is, in something like a connection machine, every one of these memory locations has a processor associated with it. So it's not exactly like you're doing something to the data. You want to think of the data doing something. So, in particular, what you could do is you could have every one of these processors could take its own address, for instance, and send it to the processor it has the address in. So that means that you've effectively established pointers back in the other direction. So that takes one step for everybody to do that. Now here's the tricky point. Now you know the addresses of people on either side of you. So that means that you can take the address of the guy on your right and send it to the guy on your left. So now everyone knows about the processor to a what. So now instead of one list going all the way through memory, you've in effect got two lists, each of which is half as long going all through memory. So in one step, that step of it sending the left guy to the right, you cut the problem in half. So that means you can do that again now with these lists. And now you repeat the process. And this one sends the left to the right again. So now everyone knows about one four away. And so each time you're cutting the problem in half. So if you have a million in 20 steps, you can get to the end of it. So you've changed the linear problem into a logarithmic problem. Well, it turns out that that trick works over and over and over again in a lot of the problems that were thought to be fundamentally sequential. So this thing that was sort of obvious to everyone, so obvious that nobody bothered to kind of prove it, just turned out to be just plain wrong. And this is one of the most common tricks in parallel processing. Now it typically comes up in, for instance, in the connection machine and using the parallel prefix operations, like the scan operations and things like that. So that trick is built into those primitives. But a lot of times you explicitly do it in the code. So if you've ever programmed on a connection machine, you've used that trick probably Without, often without even knowing. But that's why certain things run fast. So it works, for example, in computing all the subtotals of a, of a list of numbers. So that reason just turned out to be 
That, that argument just turned out to be wrong. Now the other thing, another thing that turned out to be wrong was it was surprising how little you had to modify programming languages in order to program these things. Because it turned out that in many of the cases, when you did the parallelism, the parallelism was basically parallelism that was iterated over all the data in the algorithm. So for example, a classical example is imagine you have a two-dimensional image and you'd like to do some processing step on that image. Well, the real thing that takes a long time if it has a million pixels in the image, if it's a thousand by a thousand pixels, is going through those pixels one at a time. So it's the, the long lasting things are things inside an iteration. So where your Fortran program well, you had some kind of a loop that was due for i equals blah, 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 blah. Um, and you were trying to do some, some processing stuff here. Um, so this loop here, let's say the processing step was I'm assigning an array element. So I'm assigning base of i is equal to b sub i plus c sub i. So basically what you're doing is you're evaluating some expression over a whole bunch of data. And that's really where you spend a lot of time. Now it turned out that if you just generalize the programming language to allow the expression of this kind of thing, namely doing something to a whole bunch of data at once, but that took you a long way in being able to program things in parallel. Not all the way, by the way. And I think that there's still some interesting questions left on, but it, it got you a long way to get started. So that if you replace this loop here with an expression, you just said, well, consider A, the variable A by itself, if I don't index, it just represents that whole array, A, the whole image, for instance. This is the image of the two-dimensional array. So I could, if I just write the expression in array notation, just say a equals b plus c, then in a sense, I've captured an awful lot of parallel processing inside that one expression. But it's sort of still a fundamentally sequential expression that I can mix in with the rest of my program. And so, without changing my way of programming very much, I'm basically, in some sense, the program just got simpler. I took this do loop and replaced it like that. It's a perfectly good thing to do whether you've got a parallel computer or not just to allow that expression of array syntax. <laughs> it's something uh, we've been doing in mathematics for years before computers. So it turned out that that way of expressing things got you a long way toward being able to express parallelism. And I'll come back to that in a minute um, as to just exactly how far it did get you. Um, but this notion that basically what you have was a sequential program where one step happened and another step happened and another step happened. But within each of those sequential steps, a lot of data could get operated on. It's what we started to call data parallel programming. So the notion was that you maintain the sequential model of computation. You don't worry about processors doing the different things at different times, which means you don't have to worry about synchronization. You don't have to worry about deadlock situations. You don't have to worry about a lot of things like that. And your model is, in some sense, that it all happens at once. Well, now, that suddenly addressed what a lot of the problems were with, the, with, with scaling up the number of processors. Because remember, it used to be thought that going from one to two was complicated, then it got more complicated like before, and so on. Well, how many processors do you want in this model? Well, the answer is, in this model, the most natural thing is to have as many processors as you have data. So if you have one processor for every element of the array, one processor for every element of the list in this, then that's simple. So all of a sudden, instead of wanting fewer processors, you wanted more processors. And there was a long time when you could tell if somebody was a connection machine programmer or was programming some other computer, by whether they were saying, my problem would be easier if I had more processors, or are they saying, my problem would be easier if I had fewer processors. Because if you, had, if you were using this style of data parallelism, then the more processors you had, the faster it worked. In some sense, the number of processors, if you did it right, didn't even explicitly appear there. And I guess I don't have time to get into that, but that was the, 
the whole concept of, of virtual processors. So the grain size argument turned out to be wrong. Now, what about uh, Amdahl's law? Well, if you were getting most of your parallelism in this data way, then the amount of potential parallelism scaled with the amount of data. So if you had, for instance, a 2 million bit picture instead of a 1 million bit picture, then you could use twice as many processors. So what was wrong with this argument? Well, the interesting thing was, that was turned out in practice to be wrong with this argument is that, in general, what people wanted, and let's say it took them some reasonable amount of time, like an hour to solve a certain problem. So it took them an hour to figure out how the air flowed over the airplane. Well, now, what did they really want to do? Well, the truth of the matter is, it wasn't that they really wanted to solve that hour problem in 10 minutes. What they really wanted to do was they wanted to solve a much bigger problem in an hour. So typically, they wanted to go to, for instance, higher resolution of a mesh size in their numerical calculation. They wanted to search a much bigger database, something like that. So the reason that people wanted the speed was because the resolution that they were working on was limited by the time they were willing to wait for the answer. So in practice, what people really wanted to do was solve bigger problems. Well, what happens with this argument when we scale a bigger problem? So the answer is, this big problem scales up. It goes way up there to the roof of the building. And there's still this size of S on it. Now, I divide that by 1,000. And sure enough, I get back down to this kind of situation. Because there are some fundamental sequential parts, usually to do with user interaction or overhead and things like that. And you know there is a certain amount of time, or, or sometimes in the case of IO. But what have you done here? Well, you've blown it up and then you've shrunk it. So you can get factors of thousands because you're scaling up the parallel part by a factor of thousand. This part doesn't get bigger because the part that works in parallel is the part that maps across the data. It's the data that's getting bigger. So while Ambell's law was in fact exactly right as a mathematical formulation of if what you want to do is solve this problem faster, in practice it didn't matter. In practice, in almost every case, what people wanted to do was to solve the bigger problem. So that was another surprise to all of us. And, and again, it was it was one of these things that I think a lot of people in the community just sort of gradually started realizing that, gee, this isn't this isn't working out like like we guessed it. Another specific thing happened too. The only exception to that people were worried about was if I/O was in the sequential part, then you would have been killed. Because often the input-output, particularly writing the answer to disk, was proportional to the data. So if you had to go through a sequential disk, then that part got bigger too. So that seemed for a while like it might be the bottleneck. But then it turned out that we could solve, we could solve the I.O. problem and the system very analogous to how we did the, how we did the processing problem. So, we started building on the connection machine something we call the data vault. These days we call it disk array, a root system. Which basically took, used the same trick for the disk as it used for the processors. It used very simple small disks, which were being developed for um, personal computers. I'll come back to that technology thing in a minute. And it just used lots and lots of them in parallel. Striped across. But now the reason that people hadn't felt that this was impractical is because of a reliability issue. If you had one disk crash, you'd lose all the data. So if you had 100 disks at once, then the chance of a, of a crash was 100 times as often. So what we did was put an error correcting code across these disks. So that, for instance, you wrote a 32-bit word across 40 disks with an ECC code in the other eight bits. In fact, I mean, seven of them, and you use one of them for spare. So the ECC code allows you to reconstruct the data with any bit missing. <laughs> so when we had a disk crash, we didn't miss a beat because we still had all the data there. And in the spare cycles, what we do is we just switch in the spare, read the data off the other disk, and reconstruct that one, and keep right on going. Now these days, you just do it with the parity. It takes you a little bit more time, but it's cheaper. Um, so it turned out that the I.O. had a, a way of making it in parallel, too. So that it 
came down in the P part instead of being up in the S part, which meant that it had this nice scaling property. So another one of the reasons that it looked like it was impossible turned out to be turned out to be wrong. Let me also mention the, the technology thing, because I think that's also another interesting lesson. The arguments why bipolar technology was faster than CMOS also had their counterparts in disks. There was good arguments why big disks should be faster. And they should be more efficient rather than the small disks. And so the idea was that it would have low performance disks that were used in workstations which needed to be physically small and big high performance things that the biggest one, Libroscope used to make one that was about 12 feet in diameter, were the really high performance disks. And there'd be very different technology for the high performance computers than for the low performance computers. Now, what we had begun to realize by then, I think something that had turned out in retrospect had been one of the major advantages of massively parallel computers, is that the real issue is the real cost effectiveness of the technology is actually not determined as much by these fundamental physical arguments, like the scaling law of the disk or um, the current densities of particular semiconductors, but it's in fact determined much more by economic arguments. So the interesting thing about CMOS technology was that it was being used in video games and personal computers and calculators and so on, which means that people were investing billions of dollars in building very good factories for it, getting it better, and so on. So that even in some sense, it may have been fundamentally slower than the bipolar technologies. People were investing a whole lot more in it. It was a high volume technology, so it was much more cost effective. So basically, at a time when Seymour Cray had 100 people working on his fab line to develop his gallium arsenide. I had 100,000 people, an equivalent thing, probably 10,000, literally. And they didn't work for me, but they were working on the project I wanted them to be working for. Now, they were really working for the video game makers and the personal computer makers and so on. But there was no way that Seymour's 100 people, no matter how smart they were and how good their technology was, could stay up with the technology. They couldn't have the densities of gates. Uh, they couldn't improve that technology as fast. And the same argument turned out to be true for the disk. But the fact that these things were used in workstations and personal computer meant that they were just engineered a lot better, they became cheaper, the people developed good motors for them, they became very reliable, things like that. So even though there were some fundamental reasons why these big giant 12-foot disks on it been faster, the fact is that these turned out to be a lot faster and a lot more cost effective. And the trick was if you could use them in parallel so that you could use the low-cost technology and the high volume and high volume technology into the high performance parts. And so parallelism lets you convert high volume to high performance. So that turned out to be a critical thing too. Now, the final thing that I'm going to talk about is probably the thing that took me personally the longest to figure out. And no doubt that there were other people that could have explained this to me, but it took me a while. I sort of had to see it happen myself. It's this whole issue of SIMD MIMD. And this is reflected in the transition between the CM2 and the CM5. I believed that there were very strong arguments for keeping this data parallel model, which was essentially considered an SIMD model. One thing is happening at a time. <laughs> And the arguments that I felt were, one, well, actually, the most fundamental argument is that basically people are only going to write one program because it requires people to write a program. And the only way to write, if you could imagine one program that's in a different place in the control flow of the process. My feeling was that people would get very confused about that because things would start stepping on each other's toes. And the only way that you could sort of conceptually keep things neat was this was to have moments in time when things stay together. So this happens, then this happens, and this happens. If you have two programs running in two different processors, it's too hard to think of what happens if this gets ahead of that, and A hasn't been updated yet, and too easy to get into deadlock situation. So 
this kind of um, data parallel sequential programming, I really believed in Star. So that led me to think that SIMD machines were the best way to go. Um, the other thing is at the time we built them, they were much simpler from a hardware standpoint. Because in the mid-80s, building a processor was a complicated thing because you had to build a memory system and control was a big deal and you only had a few transistors on the chip, so wasting some of them for control was uh, considered, you know, that was a lot of your hardware was the control and so on. Now, two things changed. One of them was that the technology advanced. So chips got so big that the amount of hardware you had to devote to doing control and cache control and uh, program counter and things like that became trivial in comparison with the size of the chips. So the practical issue of why that was expensive just went away because the chips got cheaper. The other thing is that we began to realize is that this model of computation over-synchronizes things. <coughs> Because you basically, in this model, when you synchronize with every instruction execution. So let's say rather than having just a simple assignment in that loop, I have something else that goes on in that loop. So the particular problem is if I have a conditional statement. And so I say, uh, if a sub i equals zero, uh, then do foo, otherwise bar, or else bar. So let's say I've got that inside the loop. And then these are very complicated things to do. And this happened in many cases. Well, now I could write a parallel version of this, right? Just a parallel version of it. Yeah. And so that. But on an SIMD machine, if I try to do sort of all the iterations of this loop at once, because you had to issue the instructions separately for who and what, there would be a serialization step where basically all the processors that didn't have i equals zero would sit there doing nothing while you did bar, and all the ones that did have i equals zero would sit there while you did foo. Now, that's only a factor of two in the worst case, in terms of how much slower it is. But you can nest it, and you can get situations where it's a factor of four or something like that. And it gets awkward, and people end up programming around it and coming up with fairly awkward constructs not to do it. But one thing that we began to realize is, in some sense, and the, the, the synchronization that you care about is not at that level at all. The reason that this data parallel model is a good model is not because it does every instruction sequentially, but its semantics are sequential in terms of dependencies. And that's a much weaker statement. So in other words, the two processors are not communicating, <laughs> then it doesn't matter in what order they do things. It's only in the places where they communicate that it matters. So if you stopped and synchronized everything at the places where they communicate, then you would have the semantics of sequentiality. But you could still go off and do foo and bar at the same time in different processors. <laughs> So what it allowed you to do was take all these programs that we liked the way to write them on the SIMD machine in the sequential way and run them and still get this kind of parallelism. Now it turned out that there were some other things. So, so what you needed was a very fast way of synchronizing things when you needed to synchronize them. What you needed was a good parallel network that allowed things to talk to each other. You needed some special hardware support for doing things like getting the same program out to everybody, so you could broadcast out to everybody at once. So you needed elements from the SIMD machine, like the broadcast, like the fast synchronization. But you didn't need to be absolutely that rigid about synchronization. So that's what the CM5 is. And what made it practical was all of this effort, engineering effort that everybody put into risk processors. They became such a good deal, it was crazy not to use them. Uh, because, again, hundreds hundreds of millions, if not billions, of, of engineering was, was going into it. So the CM5, basically, in some sense, the block diagram of the CM5 was very much like the block diagram of the CM2. What you have is a whole bunch of processors, although in this case it's the risk processors instead of those little single bit processors. It has a data network. 
again, it's somewhat more general than the data network in the CS2 because we learned some lessons about how to build those better. It has a control network, which is just like the control network in the CM2, <coughs> which basically can broadcast instructions out to all these processors or broadcast data out to all these processors and synchronize them all at once, just like the control network, and do these global reduction kind of operations. Um, it has I.O. and control processors, which you talk to each other, but they're just stuck right on these networks. So these networks become almost like a bus in which you just plug things onto. They're extendable networks now. You still can program it in this data parallel way. In fact, that's what is optimized for programming. So you can still write it, for instance, write a standard Fortran 90 program, or write a C star program. But in this case, the compiler only needs to synchronize the operation exactly where they need to be synchronized. So when things communicate, it sort of lines everything up, gets it line. So it presents, if you will, the illusion of a single instruction multiple data machine, but with the efficiency of multiple instructions. So in effect, it, it is an MIMD machine with some special hardware in here that makes it optimized for, for executing data parallel programs. So, um, that is a very different way of doing things and fix a lot of problems with the CM2. And in fact, um, it turns out to be a much more general way of doing things. And by the way, of course, since you have the hardware, if you do want to program things in the way that I don't think you should, which is have a lot of different things going on in different processors and explicitly synchronize them with message passing and so on, you can certainly do that in this hardware too. And some people don't agree agree with me that that's impossible to program that way. And those people do program like this. There are other people that, for instance, put shared memory systems on top of that. The people at Wisconsin have uh, programmed their CM5 to be basically to emulate a shared memory machine. Uh, where they, in fact, take a track and you reference somebody else's memory through this data network and move a page of memory across. So there, there are other ways of programming. And I think another thing that we're finding is parallel processing gets more mature. We'll find that more and more of the hardware looks more and more like. So it's sort of, we'll go through the stage that like the automobiles went through. When there was a time when autos first came out when everyone looked completely different. Some of them had six wheels and some of them had the steering wheel in the middle and so on. And then as people sort of figured out the right ways of doing things, they began to convert. I think what we're seeing in computer architecture is a real convergence of architectures. So I think you'll find that the um, MIMD machines will begin to get some of these features and the SIMD machines begin to be programmed in data parallel models. Uh, the SIMD machines, of course, are beginning to get MIMD features. And so you're beginning to get that convergence. So we're, we're going into the maturity stage of the system. I'm just going to spend one more minute just talking about what the limits are because as we began to discover it, um, that arguments group up parallel machines wouldn't be useful for, for raw, that's not to say that we discovered they were useful for everything. And I just wanted to say another thing we did discover that sort of follows from this argument. So it seems that the things that parallel machines are useful for are things that have a lot of data. Uh, they're generated in the course of the computation as an input, something like that, because that allows you to apply the data parallel model to all the data points. If you have a problem that doesn't have much data, you see this has the data in the pointer structure. And these are very rare, by the way, but they exist. If, for instance, I have, I want to simulate the 10 planets, and I want to know where the 10 planets are going to be 100 million years from now. So I'm solving ordinary differential equation of 10 variables. There's not much data in that, but there's a lot of computation in figuring out where it goes. I don't know any way of using a massively parallel machine on that particular problem. On the other hand, I didn't know any way of using a massively parallel machine on this particular problem, and I turned out to be wrong. So I hope somebody in the audience will show me wrong on that. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>